Hello and welcome to another episode of Search Off The Record, a podcast coming to you from the Google search team discussing all things search and having some fun along the way. My name is Gary and I'm joined today by Lizzie Sassman from the search relations team of which I'm also part of. Say hi, Lizzie. Hi, Lizzie. That's not... That, <laughs> no? <laughs> that's not... No. What? I'm just following that's orders. Not, anyway, that was Lizzie. So, <laughs> continuing with our In the Spotlight series, in which we present folks from the larger search marketing community who inspire us, today we have uh, Suzuki Kenichi from Japan. Hi, Kenichi. Hi, Gary and Lizzie, and hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to the search of the record. I'm glad to talk to you uh, for the first time since uh, I wasn't able to travel overseas. I hope our listeners will enjoy our talk. Cool. It's it's super nice to have you. I'm I'm a big fan of um, you and your blog. And when I was on Twitter, uh, you were one of my favorite uh, people to follow because uh, you were giving a perspective both from Japan and from the English search marketing region. I guess. And um, I just really enjoyed chatting with you. I remember that last time I was in Tokyo, then um, I uh, had a very nice to come in with you. Yes. Um, and I kind of feel like I need to ask you, when was the last time you had to come in? Last time? I don't remember. I think it, uh, it was three or four years ago. What? In Shinjuku. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm sorry. No. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, to be honest, I don't like skimming very much. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, Eri. I was chatting with uh, Takiyaki-san, um, someone uh, we worked with for a very long time. He was on the search team for a long time. And uh, he also said that he didn't have uh, Tsukemen for three, four years. It makes me very sad. I wish I could go to Japan and then have uh, Tsukemen with all of you. That would be fantastic. Yeah. But uh, maybe we should focus on uh, something more sar- search marketing topics rather than Tsukemen because maybe some people don't even know what Tsukemen is. I what is Tsukemen so. actually? <laughs> is it something I, I can eat? Is it Lizzie food or no? It's not Lizzie food. Oh. It's not vegetarian at all. Oh, no. The literal translation is dipping noodle. So you take the men and then you dip it like Tsukemen in a soup and the soup is uh usually bone soup but it turns out this is not a cooking show so maybe it's we should not? focus on search marketing <laughs> no it's not maybe we should uh, focus on uh, search marketing topics or even better on um Kenichi. Yes. so i'm fascinated with the history of the internet and the people who work on the internet or with the internet and how they uh, encountered uh, computers and the, the internet itself. So mm-hmm. my first two questions are usually related to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I would want to ask you about when was the first time you encountered a computer? Oh, it depends on how you define a computer. If you include a uh, say handy, simple video game, I often used to play with it as a mm-hmm. child, but uh, I began to use modern computers in my early 20s. That was over 20 years ago. Um, mm. And uh, I, was, I wasn't I was just a regular end user, but a trainer who educated system engineers about uh, how to configure internet servers, such as uh, web servers and mail servers or uh, DNS servers. I taught them how to set up, uh, manage, and troubleshoot those kinds of servers. So you were also a server manager, like you were managing networks? I was not a, a network engineer or server manager. Uh, I, I taught them how to manage oh, okay. them. But you weren't working as as a network manager or network uh, administrator or anything yes. like that. Interesting. How do you get from playing video game to then instructing people about how to manage networks? <laughs> so uh, actually, I... I was uh, interested in uh, computers, but uh, it was just uh, my hobby. But Mm. uh, at one time, uh, I was assigned uh, as an uh, administrator uh, who used Mm. a computer at a company uh, I worked for the first time after graduating my university. I found computers excellent, wonderful, amazing, 
So I had decided to learn them. And uh, while uh, learning uh, computers, I thought I should become a teacher, not a uh, engineer, because uh, I like uh, learning and teaching. That's fascinating because uh, many people I know who work in computer science have the same philosophy. Like some will decide to become um, engineers and actually do code and uh, whatnot, but others decide to uh, go back and uh, teach what they learned at university uh, without actually going to, uh, without actually working with the things that they were taught. Mm -hmm. Um, I always find this fascinating that uh, like how people are different and how they um, choose different paths. And then uh, the internet you encountered uh, a bit later, I assume. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what was the first thing that you actually looked up on the internet or where what you did on the internet the first for the first time? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I don't. I don't remember the exact time uh, when I started uh, using internet, but I think it was in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. I used to browse websites uh, or send emails to my friends. Like yeah. email forwarding? No, just uh, just like a ch chatting. So I s wrote uh, something, something daily, mm -hmm. something about my daily life. Not serious, not business, just to communicate with my friends. Oh, interesting. And then you sent it, sent that as an email. It was like uh, just chatting over email with with your friends. Yes. Oh, that's like pen pals. Yes, it's, it's like it's, it was like that. Yes. That's amazing. We were just mentioning that uh, the other day with Lizzie and uh, how wonderful that is. Uh, like the the whole idea of pen palling. Did you have like long form pen pals before and then when the internet came about, you switched to emailing or was the emailing the start of this type of uh, communication with your friends? So I didn't uh, write actual letters not so often, but thanks to the internet, mm -hmm. uh, I got uh, contact with my friends more frequently. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Because uh, sending emails uh, doesn't need stamps or envelopes, right? <laughs> all, you, all I need was just a computer and the internet. Interesting. I, I never thought of that. But do you feel that uh, emails might have been less personal than actually sending a letter, like a physical letter? Yes, in my opinion, email is more casual than the oh, actual yeah, letters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Do you remember anything that um, annoyed you about the internet when you first encountered it? Ah, yes. It was the definitely slow page speed. Yeah, I used to connect the internet through a phone line by modem. Do you know modem? Yes, I remember modems. And uh, actually, that was also my first uh, way to connect to the internet. Yeah. I remember I had a very slow, yes. like uh, 14,400 kilobound uh, modem, and it was doing those. 40,000? 40,000? No. Uh, to me, the maximum speed was uh, 128 kilo mega, kilo BBS. Yeah, I had to wait more than 30 minutes until. I completed downloading oh. three megabyte files. Yeah, the present internet has become super faster compared to the past. Yeah, um, like thinking back, and uh, if you um, were to show your child, for example, how slow it was back then, yeah. uh, I'm not even sure they would believe it that uh, or the internet could have been that slow, because as you say that when when you were downloading an image like a higher resolution image um, of a cat, for example, then it took sometimes tens of minutes yes. to download the image and it was loading the image uh, in uh, big pixels first. Yes, yes. Um, and then it was refining the pixels and loading more parts of the pixel. It was fascinating. An like incredible amount of patience just to wait for that to finish. Yeah, yeah. So 
speed was one thing anything else that you can think of for me one thing was the i think i keep saying this in every episode but the advertisements that uh, there was on the internet back then all the flashy uh blinking uh-huh. things uh, those were very annoying to to me. For example, there was lots of spam. I think we still have that kind of a problem, though. Like pop up things, like when you open a web page, yeah. and we we still haven't seemed to have gotten rid of that. Maybe it's just developed into a different way. It's less, but still an issue today. I mean, we have the interstitials and the um, newsletter not- notifications and those. It's things. like cookies, except cookies, and allow all these things to happen. And uh, still, yeah. that similar experience where you're trying to access the content and things are popping up and flashy and getting in the way. Maybe it evolved into more refined annoyment. <laughs> Do you remember when was the first time you launched a website? Yes, uh, I built my first website uh, back in 2006. It was a small. Really? It, was, it was a very small site. Uh, it consisted of uh, four or five pages. I remember. It was about uh, rice. Oh, really? Actually, uh, rice, rice, really because uh, my parents were uh, rice farmers. Okay. So I uh, created my website about uh, about uh, how to grow rice and how to cook rice, uh-huh. something like that. You keep saying this is not a cooking podcast, but I feel like it's always going to return back to food. (laughs) (laughs) Now I feel like asking how to cook rice properly. Yes, we We just want to focus in on the actual content about the food. (laughs) Maybe I'm hungry. Uh, That's actually really fascinating. Uh, So you went back to teaching again uh, with, with your website and teaching people how to farm rice and how to prepare rice i guess yes <laughs> yeah i like teaching and then uh, later you you became this uh, internet persona still teaching people about things that is happening all over the search marketing ecosystem in english mm-hmm. in other languages how did that happen so first uh, i tried to uh, involve in a uh, field marketing mm-hmm. to earn money Mm-hmm. But uh, to become a good uh, affiliate marketer, uh, SEO was uh, necessary, crucial. So I learned uh, SEO. Mm-hmm. And while learning SEO, I had uh, more interest. And I learned SEO and again and again. And at one time, someone advised me to share my knowledge with others, say on blog or on uh, by newsletter. So I began to publish uh, articles on my blog. So at this point, you already had a new site on a new domain. Uh, it was not the... Uh, it, yes, yes, yes. It was not the yeah, rice I, site. No site. <laughs> I, al- I have already caused it to shut it down. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, really? why did you shut it oh. down? Because uh, no one came to the site. <laughs> Maybe that was an SEO problem. Yes, but it cost uh, money to hold mm. oh. the domain. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. Was this, and when you had the rice site, this was before you learned SEO? Or, no, a long time yeah. ago. Uh, and so if you had known some things about SEO, do you think that the rice site would have been more successful? Yeah. Would you have done mm. things differently, like looking back on that mm. website? Yeah. Like w- w- what would you do differently now that you learned about SEO on the rice site? So uh, I found uh, I had to provide something useful Mm -hmm. and something uh, helpful to users. Right. So as for the Rice website, I just wrote what I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. I I didn't think uh, what users needed, Mm -hmm. what what users wanted. I created it for me, not for users. (laughs) And this is, again, something that we talked about the other day, Lizzie that uh, there was a time when uh, people were just publishing whatever was on their mind versus researching topics and uh, making something structured. Well, and it's interesting because in the early days, it's like, well, how would you know what people are looking for? It's like a chicken and an egg thing. Like the stuff has to be out there to, in order to know if people were looking for that. And like, why wouldn't they want to know about rice? Like, it sounds like it's a good topic to write about. Like if I'm interested in it, why wouldn't other people be interested in it? I imagine 
that the culture is different because in most Asian countries, for example, you eat lots of rice from the very beginning of your life. Um, so you probably also learn how to cook it properly. So the topic itself is not that interesting. If you want to cook ramen at home, that is something that people might be interested in because it's not a common thing to do. But cooking rice, that's just like a staple food. Like you do it every day. So, oh, maybe so you're it's saying not like the topic. user intent or like the interest from users, yeah. nobody would be searching for uh, how to make rice. Yeah. Like if I were there, then maybe I would search for it uh, as a foreigner. But locals, I would imagine that they learn it from the very beginning of their life that how to how to actually make it. Cultural differences. Uh, can you think of things that are different in Japanese SEO versus uh, English SEO? Because you have a very good overview of both uh, languages and uh, what's published in both languages. So there might be something that is different. Yes. Back uh, to that time when I got involved in SEO, that was uh, nearly 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. At that time, Google US was very different from Google Japan mm -hmm. because, uh, say, many of the algorithm update mm -hmm. weren't rolled out in Japan, yeah. say, such as a uh, panda update. That was um, 2011, 2010. Yes. Yeah, eventually a panda update uh, was rolled out uh, even in Japan. Mm. But uh, it took uh, nearly two years. Yeah, something like that. And there are other algorithm changes that had happened in Japan at the same time mm. as the US. Actually, I was frustrated about it Ooh. because I wrote uh, those algorithm updates on my blog, but actually they had nothing to do with Japanese webmasters. Mm. The algorithm updates yeah. or the posts that you were writing? Uh, algorithm update. And also, uh, say, uh, looking at the search results in the Google US, there were so uh, various kinds of features, such uh, as uh, uh, people also ask web stories. Yep. But uh, compared with it, Japanese search results in Japan lacks of features. It's so simple. Yeah, that's true. This is something that we've been struggling for a very long time. Um, and uh, feature teams sometimes opt for launching for a smaller audience, like for example, ENUS, because uh, it's easier to launch um, and they don't have to localize certain things. But most of the time they are working very hard to eventually launch it in other countries as well. And I know for certain that Japan, for example, is a high priority country for most of Google search. So perhaps that's going to get better and uh, you're going to see more features coming to Google search in Japan. Of course, this is not a promise, but it might happen. Are there any other challenges that are specific to the search results or SEO approach in Japan compared to the US? I said many features are different, mm -hmm. but uh, nowadays the gap between the US and Japan getting closer and closer. Mm. Yeah, basically, SEO in the US and uh, and in Japan was almost the same. So you think like the recommendations would be the same? You wouldn't have a different strategy for if the site is mainly in Japanese content versus in English? No, no. There are still some differences, but uh, fundamentally, we Japanese remote stars can follow uh, guidelines that are based on the US. Thanks to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lizzie, it's all your fault. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, one thing I want to improve. Oh, I uh -oh. would love to hear it. Tell me more. Yes. Translation. Yes. Is slow. Yes. It usually, it takes uh, two or three weeks. It's horrible. It's one of my until, top annoyances. Yeah, until yes, until Japanese document, documents are published. I don't like it either, but, <laughs> but I'm also not translating the content. But uh, we are working uh, on a project to improve the turnaround time to hopefully not be weeks and instead more like four or five days. We're running that right now to make sure that the quality hasn't dropped. But that is definitely something that we're trying to improve because I, I don't like it. It, it. In an ideal world, everything would be pushed at the same time, especially time sensitive announcements like blog posts when we put something out in English and then it has to be translated from that. Um, just the way that our website works, we have to check it in 
and then it gets translated. And so therefore it's always going to be after versus if we could do it before and then publish all at the same time. But I, I'm with you. It's not good. Yes, please. Yes, please speed, yes up. speed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing you loud and clear. <laughs> Actually, you are one of the few people that I see leaving feedback for us uh, relatively often. Not you, Lizzie. I'm talking to Kenichi. Sorry. Oh, I can see that. Yes. I, <laughs> yes. Yes. I sometimes uh, find something uh, strange. I mean, uh, some uh, strange translation. Yes. Like words. So, yeah, words and uh, uh, the expression. That is so useful. Whenever I find something uh, strange, I send feedback. Mm. to you do you notice if it's like specific terms that are weird or is it a sentence construction thing is there a pattern that you're seeing that's like it's usually this type of issue that you see with the translation quality i can't uh remember offhand sorry no, it's okay but uh i'll send feedback yeah if you think about it you I, can write I and, find it. and yeah, we're reading find everything that comes into that queue so if you if you write to us and say uh, you know, this word here, we don't actually use this term. It's actually this one. That would be super helpful to us. Uh, or other things where it's like maybe the sentence construction yeah. is confusing. Um, we forward it to the translators so that they can then uh, improve overall or use a different term in our glossary. Um, they've got a, a term glossary so that they know, OK, for this technical term, this is the word to use. But sometimes that's not necessarily the right one. Or we talk to people in the community and then learn that, oh, actually, it's this other thing. Uh, maybe you should consider changing it. And then we have a discussion about it. Uh, Gary and uh, I, I wonder uh, if you really uh, read our feedback. What? We do. We do. Oh, we, we, thank you. So um, we got lots of feedback, and uh, th some of them are super low quality, and they are filtered automatically. So we are not reading those. Like we are not wasting time. I mean, with, we are uh, reading them. Uh, well, you maybe. Yes, but I, they're I not don't. actionable. Like most, well, I don't know about most, but there is a portion of them that are just like this is confusing or they don't tell us what exactly is confusing about it yeah. or they're writing in to tell us they want this page indexed or something um, yeah. like it, it they want us to take some action that we're unable to do but we're still reading the post it's just there might not be anything that we can do based off of that or they're asking for specific help but then didn't give us any details about yeah. what their situation is uh, but the best type of feedback is when there's like you are clearly saying what is confusing about the thing or like, hey, like this part is actually contradicting this other part, then we will fix it like the next day or that day when we read it. We read it every day. Well, most of them we will fix the same day. Yeah. But some of them require more discussion internally mm -hmm. or we have to figure out actually how it works because it might have changed since the doc was published or something like that. Like, for example, we we are looking at some confusion about Google News sitemaps yes. versus uh, web sitemaps. And uh, the news, I, th I think the issue is that the Google News sitemap doc says something like you can only have 1000 URLs in the sitemap. And then the web sitemap says that you can actually have 50,000. So it's confusing. Right. Like which one and is actually to, the limit? Yeah. And we are trying to figure out if the Google News sitemap recommendation is good or not, um, or we have to, if we have to change it at all. But yeah, we are reading every feedback that we receive. Like this morning, I read something that just said broken. And that's it. <laughs> like I, can't do anything with that but still i read it even with those sometimes like if there's a snapshot though because there's a way that you can take a screenshot of a specific element or highlight mm -hmm. something so if someone's highlighted a link or something like that and they just wrote the word broken i can tell that they mean that the link is broken but it, that's a lot of steps to to get yeah. to figure out what they're reporting but i think we're trying so you are very prominent uh kenichi in on the internet especially japanese internet if um, you wanted to give some tips to other people how to become so prominent, mm -hmm. how to grow their persona on the internet, uh, what would you recommend them to do? Uh, yes, first, uh, you need to familiar with SEO. So my first recommendation is uh, to follow Googlers in the search version team. So they are John and Martin and Daniel and Alizzi, who often post tweets, mm -hmm. right? 
And uh, just following them is not enough. Uh, ask them when you have any questions. Mm. They are always kind enough to help us. And uh, second, uh, attending conferences is a great oh, yeah. opportunity to learn SEO. And just don't sit on a chair and quietly listen to a talk. So engage speakers, uh, praise their presentation and uh, ask them a question. Mm. So the more uh, you engage with others and especially uh, high skilled uh, SEOs, the more uh, chances uh, you can get to get to prominent mm. because uh, you can publish, you can share your thoughts, you can share your knowledge, you can share your uh, uh, skills with others. This is almost like instruction yeah. about how to be a better student to then become the teacher. Mm, yes. yes. <laughs> so if people wanted to find you, if they wanted to chat with you, then? Yes, uh, you can find me on Twitter. But uh, unfortunately, almost all my tweets are posted in Japanese. And my blog is also written in Japanese. But uh, you can use Google Translate to read my posts. Or uh, if you are learning Japanese like Gary, my <gasps> post is suitable for you. Mm. That is true. That yeah. is very true. Yeah. Uh, you are using a simple language, so it's very, very, very yeah. useful yes. for that. Yeah. Okay, so we can uh, find you on Twitter. Um, we will link to your handle on uh, in yeah. our in the podcast description. But uh, to also say it out loud, uh, Suzuki K at is the handle where you can find yes. uh, Kenichi. And uh, with that, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope to see you this year in Tokyo. Uh, for some good salad somewhere in Shinjuku. I look forward to seeing you in person sometime in the near future. Same. Same. All right. Thank you for joining us here, Kenichi. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Next time on Search of the Record, we'll be getting an insight into sitemaps. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us here, folks. We've been having fun with these podcast episodes I hope you, the listener, have found them both entertaining and insightful too. Feel free to drop us a note on Twitter at Google Search C or chat with us at one of the next virtual events we go to if you have any thoughts. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you and goodbye.